want to spend a few moments with you to kind of set the thermostat. You know, we can be a we can be a thermometer or we can be a thermostat. We can a thermometer simply reads the temperature and tells you what it is. But a thermostat sets the temperature and demands that everything around it catches up to what it's set at. And as we start this year out, let's start it out setting the thermostat. Let's not read 2020 as something that should we should just read it, read it, what happened and just kind of accept that that's the way life is supposed to be. No, we don't want to look at life as a therm thermometer. We want to set the temperature, set it on expectation, set it on the goodness of God, set it on something good is going to happen in your life, set it on God's day is today. Your day is today because God is with you. This is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Set that thermostat at love, expecting love, love and more love. Amen. Wake up today expecting the love of God. Wake up today greeting this day with the love of God. Expectation is how we set our thermostat. We set our thermostat on the goodness of God. I would have despaired unless I believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. You know, there's a word that I really want to spend time on today. And if you want to title today's teaching, I want to pick up where we left off really last week, last year. And um, and I want to talk about breakthrough and I want to talk about breakthrough in light of what it means for us today. It's the discovery of a lifetime. I want you to have the discovery of a lifetime. Breakthroughs always happen when there's a discovery first, when there's a medical discovery of something that would cure a disease. That's a breakthrough. It brings a breakthrough when there's a discovery in technology. It brings a breakthrough. You see, we're never going back. Once you have a breakthrough, you're never going back to the way it used to be. You're never going back to the way it was because you had a breakthrough. You have come to an experience of a discovery that brings you further into life. We're never going to go back to a life without the Internet. We're never going to go back to a life without, I mean, the simplest things that have happened in the last hundred and fifty years. We're never going to go back to life riding horses. We're never going to go back to life without automobiles. We're never going to go back to a life without the television or the radio or your computer or your cell phone, your smartphone. We're never going to go back to a, a life without uh, without all of the things that have brought breakthroughs. We're never going to go to a life back where we have um, the bubonic plague and the all of the, the things that happened in the past. Now we've dealt with something that, that's not quite as bad as that, but it's sure affected our world. But we're not going back. I don't want us going back to a life where we're not living in the discovery that we've found. Like that's that's living in ignorance. That's living. Who would do that once you have a discovery of something, once you discover uh, how to harness energy and how to harness gravity into t taking off in an airplane and arriving at a destination in two hours rather than 20 hours. 30 hours, 50 hours, 100 hours. Wow, you never go back. I want you to have a breakthrough in your life today that you never have to go back to the joyless life of unhappiness and life of anxiety and life of worry and life of fear. No, when you get a when you get a discovery of of the goodness of God, a discovery of looking at things God's way, a discovery of his joy and his peace. Boy, there's nothing back there for you anymore except to thank God you're not there anymore. Whew. That's what I'm talking about. Breakthrough. The discovery of a lifetime. You see the significance of a breakthrough and I'll take you through some scriptures, so hang tight. But the significance of a breakthrough is that you never go back. We're not going back. We're going forward. We can look back and be grateful. We can look back and learn. We can look back and discover, but we will not go back. We will not go back, not going back to a more complicated life. I'm staying in the simple life. I'm not going back to a life with wrong priorities. I'm staying in the right priorities and living in the advantage of what I learned in 2020. 
You know, of all the years in my life, and I've had a lot of them, as you can see from the color of my, of my beard, as uh, <laughs> it's brightening up and whitening up. But this last year, I probably learned more in this last year than any year I can remember in my life. Learn more about trusting God, learn more about being happy, learn more about simplicity, learn more about understanding things and looking at things the right way, which is what I want to spend time today talking about. Because the discovery of a lifetime is having the right perspective in life. And at the end of or so, at some point last year, I taught something that I kept seeming to come back to, you know, I kept coming back to the this optimistic way of living. I shared earlier in last year about five things, five reasons to be optimistic. And we spent some time on on several of them. But last week I really spent time on the fifth one. You remember what it was last Sunday? It was this that breakthroughs and the light of revival, breakthroughs and the light of revival are always on the other side of darkness. Breakthroughs and the light of revival are always on the other side of darkness. So when darkness is in our lives, we never have to be afraid because we can know that in the midst of that darkness, there is a breakthrough of revival or breakthrough and revival on the other side. Genesis chapter one. Since it's a new year, we might as well start at the beginning, the beginning of a new year, might as well start right where everything begins. Genesis chapter one. Let's look there. And look at verse two, Genesis chapter one, verse two. Now, the earth was formless and void and darkness, darkness was over the surface of the deep. What was over the surface darkness? What was over the surface of 2020 darkness? What might be over uh, over the surface or on the surface of your first week of this year? Maybe it's no different than the last week of last year. For most of us, it's a new year. Changing of the calendar hasn't really changed anything, but what you believe will change everything. But in the midst of darkness over the face of the deep, we're in some deep. We've been in some deep darkness, right? But the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. He's always moving. God's always up to something. God's always doing something bigger than what we see. Oh, if we were there when it happened, all we would have seen was darkness. All we would have seen was deep darkness. All we would have seen was pitch dark. But oh, when the spirit of God is moving, it doesn't matter how dark it is, because it's all about to change, because then God said, let there be light. And there was light and God saw the light it was good. See, on the other side of darkness is a breakthrough. On the other side of darkness is revival. You see, What's going to make your life better? What's going to make your life great is not a new year, but a new way of looking at life. Someone said an optimist stays up until midnight on New Year's Eve to see the new year in. A pessimist, though, stays up to midnight to make sure the old year leaves. A lot of people have kind of thought, boy, I'm sure glad 2020 is over. But 2020 being over doesn't mean. Covid's over 2020 being over doesn't mean financial problems for people are over. You see. Just leaving an old year into a new one. Is not where we need to be thinking. We need to be thinking, I'm going to leave the old way of looking at things for a new way 
of looking at things. Breakthrough and the light of revival are always on the other side of darkness. Isaiah chapter 60, verse two says, for behold, darkness will cover the earth and deep darkness of people. But the Lord will rise upon you and his glory will appear upon you and nations will come to your light. Kings to the brightness of your rising. I prophesy over you. Nations are going to come. Business opportunities are going to come. People are going to come. Favor is going to come to your light. Why? Because light is always on the other side of darkness. Wherever there is darkness, expect light. Wherever there is darkness, expect and and carry it with you and know that where you go, light goes. You step into the darkness, light has arrived. And what happens to the darkness when light comes? It disappears. You have the light inside. You will come to that in a moment as well, if I can get through this. But listen. When you get a breakthrough, you'd never go back. You keep going forward in a scientific breakthrough. Knowledge gained is used to make further breakthroughs in medical breakthroughs. You don't go back to doing things as they had been done in the past, but you use the knowledge gained to move forward. Technological breakthroughs are used to invent better things. All these improvements are made based on the breakthrough that was obtained. This can be true in our walk with God as well. We progress. We move forward from things that we learned when we had a major breakthrough. You see, having the breakthrough is awesome, but the discovery that brings the breakthrough is more awesome because the discovery that brings the breakthrough is now something that you can apply to any area of your life. Once you know how to use the breakthrough of your words or bring the breakthrough through your words, right? Jesus said to Lazarus, come forth. Once you once you learn to use the the power of your words to bring a breakthrough in your life, once you use it in one area of your life, once you experience a breakthrough, when you started declaring this is the day the Lord has made, I'll rejoice when you started declaring that happy is the man that does not condemn himself. Happy is the one that trusts in God. Once you began to speak those things, once you began to say the joy of the Lord is my strength and you had a breakthrough of joy, then what you really have done is you've you've discovered the power of your words to bring a breakthrough in that area of your life. And now you can use your words to bring a breakthrough in another area of your life. That's the beauty of what causes breakthroughs is a discovery of something that you had not either known before or you had not put to proper use before. So, man, a breakthrough begins with a discovery. And the discovery that I really want you to get a hold of today is discovering a different way of looking at things that's called perspective. If there's a word that I want you to focus on and I want us to focus on in 2021, it's perspective, how you look at something. Because how you look at something will shape how you think. How you look at something will shape how you feel, how you look at something. It's not what you look at that needs to change. It's how you look at it that needs to change because it will shape how you think, how you feel, how you react and how you act, how you behave. It's all shaped by how you look at something. In John 11, verse four, in the new international version of the Bible, when they had appealed to Jesus. We talked about this last Sunday. To save Lazarus, he's sick. The one who you love, Lord, is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. But. But it did, didn't it? Lazarus was sick and then he died. But Jesus said this sickness will not end in death. So how can those both those things be true? This sickness will not. Somebody could read that and say, you see, this 
that the Bible must not be true because Jesus said the sickness will not end in death. And yet the sickness actually did end in death. But no. If you look at it from the surface, it looks like that. But in actuality, this sickness included death. But it didn't end in death. Because how it's going. Is not as important as how it's going to end. How it's going. Is not determine how it ends. This sickness will not end in death. It included death, but then it passed right through because the one who said, I am the resurrection and the life came into that situation. And that's why don't ever judge something by the present condition of what it is. Don't allow your life. Don't allow your expectation be determined to be determined by how things look at the present moment. Because you have the resurrection and the life living inside of you. I love. The example that I've tried to give you last year of having the right perspective. I have in my hands what I believe is what every one of us needs in our lives. This is known as a two as a piece of two by four, two by four piece of wood is the most well known piece of lumber. It's actually called a two by four, even though it's really not quite two by four. (laughs) It's really like one and a half or one. But it's known as a two by four. And I love the name two by four because it is what I'm trying to illustrate with perspective, because every one of us needs to get hit over the head with like with this two by four. Everybody needs to get hit over the head with a two by four because that's what's going to give you perspective. And what I mean by that is we need to change the two into a four. We need to change the two into a four. And what does that mean? You you've heard me say it a thousand times, maybe last year. So I'm starting over. So count with one right here. And and we'll see how many times that I repeat this over this next year. But listen, we have to change how we look at something from life is happening to us to. To life is happening for us, for we have to go from two to four, we have to get hit over the head over our way of thinking, our way of thinking needs to be slammed with this two before and we need to change the two to a four life isn't happening. Instead of life is happening to me, life is happening for me. Do you see the difference? Life is happening to me is I'm a victim of whatever happens to me. Life is happening for me. I'm a witness of what God is doing for me. Life is happening to me, so I'm subjected to whatever happens to me. That's your old way of thinking. Get hit with this. And all of a sudden you're looking at something bad that happened in 2020 and you're like, you know what? Something that happened last year is happening for me. The bad things that happen are happening for me, not to me. Look at the you see, it's. The same things happened in two in 2020. Whether you. Take a life is happening to you or life is happening for you approach, the same things happened. But how you look at them is what's changed, how you look at them is what's different. And this is what brings breakthrough in your life. Life hurts the most not from pain. Because everybody's learned that there is pain in this life. But life hurts the most. Without perspective. Life hurts the most, you see, something can really hurt. But it hurts far more with the wrong perspective. Life is limited. Without perspective. Life is bitter without perspective. Bitterness comes from a limited. Point of view. I'll call it littleness of view, littleness of view, just seeing a little part of what of what is happening and not realizing there's so much more happening behind the scenes that you know nothing about that God is at work in Romans 8, 28. That He's causing all things to work together for good 
for you. That he's doing exceeding abundantly above and beyond all that we can ask or think according to the power that works within us. Ephesians 3.20 says. Life hurts the most without perspective. Life is limited without perspective. Life is bitter without perspective and life is too serious without perspective. Frankly, gang, life is too serious without perspective. You got to back up and look at life not so serious. We take things so serious. We take ourselves so serious. We look at the world and, you know, we think, the wow, man, I don't mean to, you know, use slang here or negative language, but you might take the approach this world sucks. But, you know, the right perspective says, you know what? If the world didn't suck, I'd fall off. Thank God <laughs> it sucks sometimes. Some of you get that later. I get it. Um, listen, a really happy person is someone who can enjoy the scenery on a detour. If you get detoured, you're trying to get somewhere and there's a detour that's going to take you longer. You can take the have the perspective of man, it's going to ruin my day. It's going to ruin my or you can take the perspective of let me enjoy the scenery on this detour. Let me take advantage of the extra time that I have by maybe forgiving some people in my life that I've been holding something on to, maybe forgiving myself for something like God's given me some extra time to talk to myself about something, to confront something in my life, to adjust my attitude, to adjust the thermostat of my love walk, to adjust the thermostat of my peace, to adjust the thermostat of my kindness. Boy, everything that happens in life we can take as an opportunity. And that perspective is what will change everything in your life. You know, I like to um, share from the book of Philippians because it's one of the greatest books that gets my mind right. It gets it gets me thinking right because it gives me it gives me such perspective. I've looked at the book of Philippians as the book of perspective and celebration. The two things that we find in the book of Philippians is we find joy in Paul's life in the book of Philippians and the admonition to rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, as he says in Philippians chapter four. Right. And we we see if we don't understand the context in which the book of Philippians, some of us think that, you know, Paul's just enjoying life on the Mediterranean Sea and God blows this gentle breeze over his sailboat as he's tanning in the summer months off the coast of Italy, writing letters to people. Oh, let me write to the Colossians today. Oh, Lord, I'm feeling so good. Let me write to the Philippians today. But yet Paul wrote the book of Philippians from prison. The book that has more joy than any other book. The book that has more peace than any other book. I'm not saying all the other books aren't as inspired by God, but for me, it gives me perspective that he wrote. His greatest to me, the masterpiece of Paul's. Writing to me, it's how it's how I see it. You know, you you love Picasso. I love Michelangelo. They're both awesome. (laughs) Right. You love Ephesians. I love Philip. I love all the Bible. You get what I'm saying. Um, Chapter one of Philippians is all about thank you. Thank you. He's in prison and he's thanking the Philippians. For being in his life. Thank you. I thank my God. For every remembrance of you. Always offering prayer with joy. In my every prayer for you all. Encouragement. 
in Philippians 1, that God's going to do what he he's going to finish what he started. Right. In verse six, he who began a good work in you will complete it. But you got to see he who began a good work in you will complete it. But one of the things that helps complete it is what happens before verse six. Verse six is awesome by itself. I'm confident in this very thing that he who began a good work in you will perfect it, complete it, finish it until the day of Christ Jesus. And yet the reason why one of the reasons why God's going to complete it is because Paul's praying for them. Well, in other words, if if everything's going to happen without prayer, then why pray? Our prayers are powerful. He said, I'm always offering prayer with joy in my every prayer for you all. Like, in other words, part of the. God. Finishing what he started, completing what he started in us is the is through the power of prayer, part of God finishing, you know, even in um, second Corinthians chapter one, I think verse 11, where God says where Paul says he has delivered us. He is delivering us and he will yet again deliver us. He says that. And he says, and part of his rescue plan, I think it's in the message translation, but he says part of God's rescue plan is your prayers. You guys have prayed for me. Part of the rescue plan is. Prayer. So back to Philippians chapter. Well, chapter one. Wow, such. Such love for people that Paul has, such encouragement that Paul offers, such perspective from prison. And man, a lot of us, if we were in prison <laughs> because of preaching the gospel, like Paul was in prison, not for stealing or for murder or some crime, he was in prison for preaching the gospel. And he, all he could think of was how special the people were in his life. You know, sometimes our greatest trials give us a, an appreciation for people. Sometimes when we lose something that we thought was really valuable, we or something that really was valuable, but we we begin to appreciate the things that are truly valuable. We begin to appreciate them more. That's perspective. Chapter two of Philippians, maybe this year we'll dig deep in each one of these chapters. But in chapter two, to me, it's all about our attitude. He said, have this attitude in you that was also in Christ Jesus, that though he was equal to God, he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Taking on the form of a bondservant just didn't didn't just become went from God to man. He went from God to servant man. And then being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself, it says. By becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Wow. This Jesus, we get to call our, our friend, our savior, our Lord. Such humility, an attitude of humility, have this attitude of humility is what Chapter two to me is about chapter three is about my destiny. It's about your destiny. Paul's saying, look, forgetting those things that are behind reaching, pressing on. To me, chapter three is a declaration that there's nothing in my history that is greater than my destiny. There's nothing in my history that's greater than my destiny, destiny. And there's so much more in chapter three and chapter four is all about joy. Rejoice in the Lord. Always again, I say rejoice. Anxiety is a signal to pray. It's all about how we can be free from anxiety, how we can be free from worry, how we can be at peace and gentle. Verse five, be gentle with all. Gentleness and kindness and empathy is never wrong. Jesus said, I'm gentle, I'm humble of heart. You see, the simple things sometimes are missed. To write this book from prison really speaks to me about perspective. 
What are what is your prison? What are you dealing with? What do you feel has been the bars, the prison bars that have held you back? They don't have to hold you back if you shift your perspective. Getting out of prison was never Paul's goal. <laughs> He's in prison here and he he writes the book of Philippians. He's in prison in Acts chapter 16 and he starts him and Silas start singing and praising God, not as a formula to get out of prison, but because they were so thankful to be considered God's servants thrown in jail on his behalf. Like we're, we considered it an honor. They considered it an honor to suffer for his namesake, for his glory, for his honor. Paul and Silas are singing and praying and singing hymns again. They're not following a form. They're not showing us the formula to get out of prison because as they're singing hymns and praying, the Bible says the earth shakes and there's an earthquake in this prison and the, and the it shakes so much that the prison doors open and the chains come come off of all their hands and all their feet. And yet they don't go anywhere. They stay right where they're at, praising God. And the jailer wakes up when the earthquake happens and he sees that the prison doors are open and he sees that the chains are off everybody, all the prison. He grabs his sword because he's he knows that he's he's going to be killed by the emperor for letting these guys out. He's about to kill himself. And Paul says, hey, don't harm yourself. We're still here. We didn't go anywhere. Think about that. Paul's life was full of prisons. And yet every time he was in prison, his goal was never to get out of prison. His goal was always to trust God and learn. And I'm not saying that if anybody's in jail today that they should stay in jail. I'm trying to tell you that regardless of your circumstances, the right perspective is what brings true freedom in your life. The right perspective was Paul's all about winning souls. He's like, hey, we're still here. Don't kill yourself. And he called for lights, went running in there and he said, what must I do, sirs? He threw them in there like you piece of crap, threw them in there earlier, right? Threw them in there, you trash, you, you guys against the emperor, throws them in prison. It's a tough jailer. And the prison doors open from an earthquake. Paul's like, we're still here. And he's like, sirs, <laughs> not chumps anymore, not trash anymore, sirs. <laughs> what must I do to be saved? And he said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your whole household. And this started a revival of salvations. Why? Because breakthroughs and revival are on the other side of darkness. Don't be afraid of the darkness you're facing, the prison you're in. Shift your perspective. You see, if we could close with these thoughts for a moment, I'd say the right perspective that we need to approach this life with and this year with, the right perspective sees problems as opportunities. The right perspective that we learn from Paul is we see the right perspective sees problems as possibilities. Well, I'm in prison. What can I do? I think I'll write a letter that'll last. Hmm, I don't know, two or three thousand years and encourage people for the rest of the hist human history <laughs> on this earth before Jesus returns. <laughs> Not a bad accomplishment while in prison. What could I do in this prison? Prayed that he who began a good work would finish it. Taught us about anxiety, taught us how to be free from panic, taught us how to think on these things. Whatever's good, whatever's lovely, whatever's good report. Talked about changing our attitude to gratitude and humility. It's all about thanks in chapter one, all about attitude and gratitude chapter one and all about humility in chapter two. Boy, I just talk about this all day, but the right perspective sees problems as possibilities. You heard me tell the story of World War II hero General Creighton Abrams and his men surrounded by the enemy and General Abrams as they were all surrounded by the enemy. He looked at his men and declared with complete confidence, gentlemen, we are now in a position to attack the enemy in any direction. But that's looking at problems 
as possibilities being surrounded. Wow, we can we can attack them from any direction. How great is this? The right perspective sees problems as possibilities to the right perspective sees people. Well, the right perspective sees the present condition through the eyes of faith. Second Corinthians 4, 18 says, while we look not the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen for the things that are seen are only temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. What he's saying is the right perspective sees the present condition through the eyes of faith. We walk by faith, not by sight, no matter what I'm going through right now. God has a plan. God has a purpose. God has something, something up his sleeve. I believe no matter what I'm looking at, I'm walking by faith, not by sight. I'm trusting the promise of God against all hope. I have hope against all that is against me in my natural physical body. Abraham said, but he believed God that he would keep his promise. That he would have a son. He's 100 years old. Sarah's 90. What was their perspective? Their perspective was we believe. No matter what the present condition looks like. We choose faith. We choose to live by faith. So the right perspective sees problems as possibilities. The right perspective sees the present condition through the eyes of faith and the right perspective sees people not as problems to solve, but people to enjoy. The right perspective sees people not as a problem. Boy, if we could lose the mindset that people are our problem, if we could lose the mindset that people are what's holding us back, if we could lose the perspective of that somehow people are against us, because it, once you realize that God is for you, whoever is against you is irrelevant. God is for you triumphs over all that is against you. But if we could take a moment. And begin to look around us. At the people in our lives, you know, you might not have anybody else in your life, but you got me. I got you. I'm sure you probably have other people in your life, but just in case you don't. You got me. I got you. We got each other. We're better together. You understand? Like. Whatever is happening in your life, people. Are everything one of the things that God spoke to me last year is people are everything to me. You are the apple of God's eye. People, he said, people are my people are everything to me. There's nothing that matters more than people. God wants to save them. God wants to heal them. God wants to bless them. God wants to save you. God wants to heal you. God wants to bless you. Hey. People are not our problem. We've got to stop seeing people. As a problem to solve and instead see people. See them as people to enjoy. Boy, there's joy and enjoyment that can come in any relationship you have in your life. If you stop thinking of that person as a threat to your happiness or as potential that can make you unhappy or miserable in life, or that they're not my solution and they're not my problem, but they are a human being in my life that God wants me to enjoy, to thank God for, to thank them for and to celebrate over. Come on, let's pray. If you're watching right now as we close, if you've never received Jesus Christ as your savior and Lord, pray this out loud with me. It's so simple. Just pray this. Heavenly Father, start this year just talking to God. Heavenly Father, I invite Jesus Christ. Just say that I invite Jesus Christ into my life as my savior and Lord. I believe Jesus died for my sins and rose from the dead from this moment forward. I am a child of God. If you prayed that prayer to receive Jesus Christ as your savior and Lord, you should see on the screen a link that you can go to and get my gift. The power of a new life is absolutely free. It's my gift to you. To celebrate your new life and to show you the next steps, to walk you through the next steps in this journey with Jesus. 
It's a relationship with God. It's not a religion. It's a relationship with God. To all of us, we're better together. I want you to say this, say in Jesus name. The right perspective, I choose the right perspective to see problems as possibilities. To see the present conditions through the eyes of faith. And to see people not as problems to solve. But gifts in my life to enjoy and to be thankful for and to celebrate in Jesus name. I celebrate you. I can't wait. For us to come back together in our next service. I can't wait to see you then. God bless.